OK, so let's look at next generation cryptography. So some of these methods are happening now. Some are just evolving and some are very much for the future once uh, processing capabilities catch up with uh, technology. So the areas that we're going to cover uh, are lightweight cryptography, which is definitely happening now, quantum robust crypto, tokenization, zero knowledge proof, homomorphic encryption, and a little bit of ZK snarks and range proofs. So I'll try not to go too much into the mathematics involved uh, for these methods and try to understand mainly the core concepts of what each of these methods are and how we might use them in the future. So first, let's uh, cover a topic which is happening now, and that's related to lightweight cryptography. So most of our conventional encryption uh, methods are focused on high-powered uh, desktops, tablets and smartphones. They often have uh, a good processing capabilities, uh, good battery uh, capacity, uh, good amounts of memory and, and so on. So AES uh, for symmetric key, public key uh, methods, RSA, elliptic curve, are typically focused on those types of uh, computers. But there's a new wave of computing devices, and these are defined as lightweight uh, devices. So there could be embedded systems, 8-bit uh, processors, 16-bit, uh, uh, and RFID and sensor networks. So often what we have is a passive RFID tag which has no actual uh, energy source and must couple its energy from the radio waves that we emit to be able to uh, read it. So the cryptography methods that we've, that we've actually defined really don't fit in well with that type of uh, device. So then we create uh, methods called lightweight cryptography methods, which will look to optimize uh, the balance between uh, power drain and uh, performance, that's the, the basic throughput against power drain. And also we need to look at the gate equivalence. So that is the number of, of electronic gates that it will take to actually create our methods. With something like AES, we have fairly li large block sizes, 128 bits. So we're going to need to keep that in our memory. And we also have the S box, as you remember, and the the the, the row and the column uh, uh, swaps. So it's fairly intensive in terms of its, uh, its processing. It's very secure, but uh, it causes us uh, problems. Along with that, we need to have low RAM uh, considerations for uh, running the, the lightweight crypto and then any ROM, so this is the storage of the code, so that when it's loaded up, it can run within inside the RAM. And then finally, we need to define uh, the, the area that our cryptography function uh, takes up. So some of the methods that we have, we'll just open up a page here. Some of the methods that we have uh, are these. So we have a whole lot of block ciphers, uh, XT, present, Simon, spec, and, and so on. And these are focused on producing uh, uh, producing a fast throughput and hopefully are optimized for uh, the, the battery dream. Then we have the stream ciphers. Uh, so RC4 and ChaCha20 can certainly be used here. They are very efficient uh, in terms of their, their operation. All we need is an XOR gate to take our key stream. So we have a passphrase, we generate a key stream, and then we XOR the key stream with the data stream, and that gives us our cipher stream. On the other end, we take the cipher stream, we regenerate the key stream, we XOR again, and we get back the data stream. That's real time, there's very little latency there, uh, and also it's efficient in terms of uh, what's required for uh, the encryption process. So these are some of the ones here that have been defined by uh, NIST. And then we have the hashing methods. 
These are using uh, different methods from MD5 and SHA-1 and are fairly well optimized in terms of uh, the processing power and also in terms of the, uh, the memory that they use up. We also have a MAC, uh, if you remember that's a message authentication code where we have a shared secret and we sign our hash codes with that shared secret. So the other uh, side can actually determine whether we're still the, uh, the right entity communicating. And then finally, there aren't too many asymmetric methods that are looking to replace our public key methods. Early is one as a lightweight uh, asymmetric key encryption method. In terms of signing, uh, we may be focused on uh, using uh, hashed based signing for, for the future. And this will always also give us advantages when we look at uh, quantum robust cryptography. So the site itself, uh, if you go to ASCII, the site should give you lots of examples, it give you bits of code that you can actually try, and there should be uh, test vectors there. Uh, this one here <coughs> is one of the most the smallest footprint uh, encryption methods and one of the fastest uh, around. Okay, so that's that's some of the methods that, that we have for our lightweight crypto. And uh, increasingly, we need to be looking at these things. Normally what we have is something like, if we're using a block cipher, we only have 64 bits in terms of the, the block size to, to reduce the, the amount of space and the key size might actually be reduced from 128 bits down to maybe 72 bits. Uh, and uh, uh, that makes it much more efficient. So for a method like RC4, we can have a variable uh, key key length. And obviously it's a stream cipher, so it's uh, fairly uh, efficient in terms of its operation. So another area that's happening uh, just now is quantum robust uh, uh, crypto. And the problem that we have with, uh, quant with uh, quantum computers is it's been shown that they will break uh, our existing public key methods. So that includes uh, RSA with its factorization of uh, prime numbers and also elliptic curve uh, methods. And along with that, it will break discrete uh, logarithm methods uh, such as uh, El Gamma en encryption and uh, Diffie-Hellman. So the methods that have been put in place uh, to overcome the, uh, the problems around quantum uh, uh, cracking are lattice-based methods, uh, code-based cryptography, multi-polynomial cryptography and hash-based signatures. Uh, I won't go into the detail of each of those, but certainly uh, you can go and investigate some of them. There is great open source code if you want to have a look. <coughs> but each of them are seen to be uh, difficult problems to solve, even when uh, quantum computers come along. So in the associate lecture, you can click on the link and hopefully you'll be able to uh, uh, see some of the methods actually uh, that are involved. But many, uh, many uh, open source projects are already, especially if they're blockchain based, are already looking to integrate these types of um, quantum robust uh, crypto. And the reason for that is that uh, anything that appears on the blockchain will stay on the blockchain. And obviously, if something is signed now or is protected using uh, elliptic curve or RSA, then in five or, years, five or ten years' time, when uh, quantum computers come along, uh, that data could be cracked and open to everyone. So there's a bit of a rush just on just now, and uh, NIST have a competition out uh, on, uh, on finding the best solution for uh, quantum robust cryptography. So something that's happening just now uh, is, is tokenization. And tokenization is, is really a new way of uh, understanding how we can pass data, we, how we own assets. So uh, what we have with, uh, with our existing 
uh, banking infrastructure is that if Bob wants to pay Alice, then Bob sends a transaction to Bank A, who transfers it to B, and then we include the sort code and the account ID and so on. In this way, we have a, a ledger on either side, so Bob's ledger records a negative and, and Alice's uh, uh, bank records a positive and it should all balance. In a blockchain world and with cryptocurrency, Bob just gets Alice's ID, will then uh, sign a transaction with their private key and then create a signature uh, onto the blockchain which will transfer the money from Bob to Alice. This public key is added to the signature and anyone can actually check that it was Bob that signed it without Bob having to release his public key as we have in uh, PKI. So one of the first countries in the world who has created what's called a blockchain act is uh, Liechtenstein. So this was their our consultation process there, but they've went ahead and created a blockchain act. And its main focus is really to make sure that uh, uh, what we enact on a blockchain system or with inside electronic tokens which are signed has the same legal certainty as our existing financial and legal world. So within it, there are three main tokens that we have. Our payment tokens, that's like Bitcoin, Monero, Zcash, Ripple, and so on. Then we can also have uh, our utility tokens. So the utility tokens are tokens that we would use for bus travel, airline travel, and so on. And then we might see the opportunity to create security tokens. So as a security token, we can actually buy and sell things and trade with a, a, a signed token that will define the ownership of an artifact. So in this way, we need to understand how we can transfer these tokens and what it means to own them and also what it is to possess them, how we can transfer them to other entities. And then we might also have a custodian because sometimes we don't actually store, uh, we don't actually keep our private key, but we might trust someone to be the custodian of the private key and to make sure that uh, our, we, they can conduct our business for, for us. In this way, the custodian could be a solicitor who's signing on behalf of Bob to purchase a new home. And this is what the, the Liechtenstein Blockchain Act looks like. So you see here, all it really defines is to make sure that there is a regulation uh, within electronic tokens and cryptocurrency, blockchain uh, methods, uh, and that that has some legal certainty in, in there. So within uh, our existing businesses, we make sure that we have audit compliance and we need licenses to be able to operate. And the Blockchain Act aims to do that, that kind of thing and make sure that it fits in with existing uh, regulations. So the one way that we typically uh, hide data is we create a surrogate mapping table. In this way, we can take uh, an ID and we can map it into a surrogate ID and then uh, only that ID is seen in the wild. But unfortunately, uh, it's not too difficult to map a surrogate back to a real ID once you actually know what the mapping is. And many data sets can be brought together and set, set up so that it's possible to be able to discover what the uh, surrogate mapping actually is. So within a tokenization world, we deal with tokens and we don't actually have to deal with uh, fiat currency. We should all see that anything to do with fiat currency or visa card numbers and bank details should exist in a high security infrastructure and we shouldn't be giving away sensitive information for that. If we deal in tokens, then those tokens aren't actually real uh, cash. So increasingly what we should see is the personally identifiable information 
is stored behind tokenization infrastructures, which are highly secure. And then in our open world, we deal with anonymized tokens, which will not reveal any personally sensitive information. In this way, we can have low security on our token infrastructure and high security when we map it back in to our tokens. So many banks are now looking at this type of infrastructure because they already have a, to a data processing infrastructure and they need to make sure that they can now deal with the electronic tokens rather than with the core data. So we'll generate tokens, we put it into our data processing infrastructure and then pass the tokens into a highly secure tokenization surface. That will give us replies back as to say whether Bob has enough money in his account to be pay for a certain purchase without revealing that uh, the amount of money that uh, Bob has in the account. So for the tokens themselves, we just need to make sure there's no crypto analysis of them, no direct attacks, no side channels, no token mapping and no brute force. So this is Visa's best practice for a tokenization infrastructure. We see we have the best of breed uh, cryptography. Obviously that could be open to uh, quantum uh, computer attacks in the future, but this is as good as we're gonna get uh, these days, minimum standards for our encryption. We have some way to be able to talk, generate our tokens so that there is no attack. Sometimes it's a one way, one time token, or it could be multiple tokens and so on. Then we need some way to be able to manage the keys to make sure the 24 seven monitoring and so on. And then there is credit card vault information which has strong encryption applied. And then finally, there's the mapping of the actual token ID back to the actual data. So here's an example here where Bob requests a token from the tokenization service. And in this case, his CVV number is, is anonymized uh, onto the token or changed onto the token. We can also change his bank details and, and even his name and so on. Then when he purchases, he hands the token onto the merchant who hands it to the merchant acquirer and then they pass on the token to the tokenization service who will then check to see if Bob has enough money in his account. If he does, it replies back saying yes. So the whole of infrastructure can be uh, can be uh, misled into thinking it's dealing with real data when actually it's anonymized uh, data. And the good thing with this is the tokenization server can get in contact with Bob straight away to say that they have actually authorized the payment. This gives a nice out of band uh, acknowledgement of the, the payment. And then there is an amazing method called uh, Format Preserving Encryption or FPE. With this, we can actually specify the format of the cipher output. Normally it's B64 or binary or something like that. We can actually create FPE methods that take a secret passphrase or a nonce and then convert the a date of birth into a valid, another valid date of birth. It takes a credit card detail uh, number and maps it to another credit card. If you're interested, the link on the presentation should give you some examples of this. So here's one in here. And that's my password there. Uh, this is my alphabet that I'm going to have. And I'm going to generate a new credit card uh, detail. And that, that's it there. Okay, so we can also specify things like alphanumeric. We can make sure that it starts with a certain number, such as in a Visa card and so on. And all we need is the passphrase to be able to uh, decrypt it back again. Okay, so that was tokenization and tokenization is happening in a big way and will really start to take off in the next five years or so. And hopefully we'll see uh, tokens, security tokens being used increasingly for the transfer of assets. Now, we look at an important area called zero knowledge proof and credential signing. And zero knowledge proof comes from this type of uh, analogy. In this case, we have uh, Peggy, the prover, and Victor, the verifier. So Victor uh, goes away and then asks Peggy to go into the cave. Kate, 
Peggy will pick either route A or route B. And Victor wants to prove that she knows the open sesame, eh, sesame password to be able to open up the, uh, the secret passageway between the caves. So she goes in and Victor comes back in and asks uh, Peggy to appear through entrance A. And she does appear, but can she, has she proven that she knows the secret passphrase? In this case, no, because she could have went down A and then just returned back here. But the more times that uh, Victor prompts her, the more times she will prove that she actually knows the secret. If she went down A again and Victor asked to appear at B, she'll not be able to do that. And then Victor knows that she doesn't actually know the secret. So the general knowledge proof is all about that. And it was this uh, great person here, Odi Shamir, who uh, came up uh, with, uh, with a method that allows us to be able to uh, store uh, or prove that we know something without actually giving it away. In this case, we're trying to overcome the problem of hashing a, a, a password and then storing salt with it because unintruders can just use Hashcat to be able to crack that because they know the salt. In a zero knowledge proof world, then uh, Peggy registers something and this can be a random nonce value. Then Victor sends a challenge and uh, Peggy responds back with the answer to the challenge and then can actually prove that that was the right uh, password. So the method that uh, is used, we take the password, we take a hash of it, we create a value of x and then we take y to the power of x. That's our discrete logs and we also have a mod p in there if we want and then that gets registered. So Peggy picks a value of v and then sends over g to the power of v. Uh, Victor generates a c value for the challenge. Uh, Peggy uh, calculates v minus cx, sends back that value and then does a quick calculation. So if you're interested in how that works and if it works then click on the link there and the, and the PDF. But now if, uh, if it's a correct value for uh, the t value then uh, we know that uh, it's, it's, it, it, uh, the Peggy has proven that she knows her password. Her password is never sent to Victor. So this is one of the classic methods that we have and it's called non-interactive random oracle access and in this way that Bob proves that he knows his secret which is x. Uh, if you're interested uh, we've got examples on the the website to be able to show that uh, this all works. Another area that uh, is likely to take off in the next five years uh, but we currently don't have the computing power to scale it properly is homomorphic encryption. And homomorphic encryption is all about encrypting values and then to be able to operate on them mathematically or to find things out uh, without actually revealing the original uh, values. So it could be something like proving your salary or adding all the salary values together for a company without actually revealing uh, the actual data within uh, uh, the, the encrypted values. So in this way we can make sure that our data processors and even when we're storing data and processing it, it doesn't reveal any of the sensitive data. So homomorphic encryption can be useful to be able to find out uh, who's older, Bob or Alice, uh, and what's their total income without revealing their income. So one of the first methods that was uh, proposed was uh, proposed as DGHV and in this we have a secret key and we can put it into a function. The function performs something with the cipher bits and then we get a result back and we can decrypt it. In this way our data processor can process for us without actually knowing any of the values and this means that we won't be able to be attacked from within memory. 
So if you notice, this is what happens. We take our integer values, we put them into cipher bits, which become very long values, and then we put it into circuit. Every single function can be represented as a circuit like this with XOR and AND operations. XOR is add and AND is multiply, but we're only dealing with one bit at a time. We then feed that out to decipher the bits and convert them back into our output values. In this way, everything in here is secret. If you're interested, here is the basic calculation that we do for our cipher bits, and that's how we calculate them. We take our bit and then we create a cipher inter integer value, which is actually pretty is large. An area that's happening just now is what's called ZK snarks, and that's used within uh, blockchain methods to be able to find things out without actually revealing the original data. And it's used within Zcash uh, to create zero knowledge proofs, and we can actually search Zcash and reveal if a person has enough cryptocurrency in their account to be able to go ahead with the current, uh, the current transaction. The problem with it though is that it takes a long time to actually create the original zero knowledge proof for it, but increasingly we're bringing that uh, time uh, down. And what the ZK Snarks does is to be able to mine across transactions and then use a, a, an additive function to be able to find out if Bob actually has enough money in a cryptocurrency in his account to pay for the current transaction without revealing all his transactions. As we found out in Bitcoin, unfortunately, uh, uh, the blockchain can give away uh, who the sender and the receiver is of our transaction. The other thing that ZK Snarch does is that it allows the smart contract to receive values without actually knowing what those values are, but still to be able to process on them. So in this way, we have a, a val blind evaluation and also hid hidden homomorphic encryption. So if you're interested, uh, and it's quite a tough area, uh, there's some uh, basic theory that uh, you can find uh, from from uh, some of the classic articles online, but we wouldn't expect you to understand uh, the deep uh, methods used. Uh, a framework called Hawk is being uh, pushed just now, and this would allow smart contracts to run off the blockchain and take away a lot of the processing that's required on the blockchain at the current time, but still for those smart contracts to be trusted. This is what Hawk looks like, and it would allow much more trust and distribution of these processes. And now we have range proofs and Petterson commitments and so on. All of these things will start to build new types of applications which are much more citizen focused and focused on not giving away uh, personally sensitive information. So remember we came across uh, our elliptic curve, we take a point on elliptic curve, we add it a given, a given number of times and we end up with our public key. So the values, the value that we have for the number of times that we add, the point is defined as our private key. So that's it there, 256 bits and 512 bits for a public key and there's our G value and obviously we have our prime number there. So how do we hide uh, transactions? Well, we can hide them by having a blinding factor. And a blinding factor can bring in another curve and we can keep this value secret. So our commitment or our transaction onto the, onto the blockchain can then be our, uh, our private key. And then our, our V value, which is uh, our blinding value. So in this way, we can blind transactions on to the uh, blockchain, but also be, still be able to process them. And this method uh, is proposed for uh, Bitcoin and is defined as Mimblewimble and appeared in 2016. It also has its own GitHub, uh, which is now looking to hide uh, transaction values by keeping uh, a secret value in the wallet. This is how it works. We have a blinding factor here of r equals 10. And we have two points. The value is four bitcoins. So obviously if we put the four bitcoins onto the blockchain, then it would be able to, 
you'd be able to see that it was that value because if, if Bob had already spent four bitcoins on something, then it would just appear as the same value here. So what we do is we take a blinding factor, in this case R is 10, and we add it as another point and we add them together. Without knowing the blinding factor, we can't tell what the value of V is. So Bob keeps that in his wallet uh, and then whenever Alice wants to see what the value is, then Bob will tell, send that value to Alice and show uh, the value and then she can actually determine that it was four bitcoins. Another method that's been proposed that hides information is a range proof. With this, often what we have with online systems is that we don't actually have to prove our age, but we have to prove the, the, the range that our age is in. So in this case, Vic, uh, Peggy just has to prove that uh, she is over 18. So our range proof is that I can prove that I'm over 18 without actually showing her age. So in this case, we take a trust identity who signs for that age proof range and then that is passed to Victor, who verifies it. He trusts this entity here, Trent. He has that their public key and is able to show that uh, it was them that signed uh, Peggy's proof. So bulletproofs are defined, and they're defined as very short uh, uh, assessments of, uh, of a range proof. And they don't increase in size uh, they are short and can be uh, merged together. So this is a typical operation. So this is the money that Bob's got in and this is the money that went out. And a typical operation is we, we look at the unspent transactions to make sure that Bob has enough unspent transactions to buy something that's two bitcoins. But the problem is, is that we reveal all of his uh, transactions from there and that breaches his privacy. In, uh, in, in bulletproofs and in range proofs, we can actually do this calculation and find out and even blind the transaction itself and still find out if Bob has enough unspent transactions to pay uh, Alice. So Monero, one of the cryptocurrencies uh, that uh, really sees uh, uh, privacy at, uh, as a core objective, uh, implemented this and showed a 80% reduction in the transaction size, which obviously reduces the amount of overhead in transaction fees on the blockchain. So this allows for uh, much better uh, uh, signatures. It allows for the aggregation of range proofs into a single short uh, signature, and it's really focused on uh, blockchain integration and also where we get rid of the trust infrastructure, such as we see within PKI. So with bulletproofs, we can actually prove that a financial institution has liquidity because we would want to say, show that you've got more than a billion dollars in your account uh, just now, and we could actually detect if there was any fraud with inside the system. Okay, so that's been uh, uh, an overview of uh, next generation crypto. Make sure you have a look at the lab and try some of these methods out and also on to the website. Okay, thank you.